So, Eileen, we are in Ecuador now in Quito in 2010 and we're talking about uh, mysterious uh, history. And I think we can also say that we, we are going to, to talk about your father, who is in a way a uh, mysterious person. And I wonder that, when, how is it that he's Scottish and how did it happen a long time ago that one day he wakes up in Scotland and decided to come to Ecuador for what? Uh, it's, it's about the Taos history, whoever there was Taos mm -hmm. in Ecuador. How did he relate it to this whole story for the first time? How did he hear about that? How, why did he come over? Um, what um, other people maybe motivated him, mm -hmm. or how did the whole story start that uh, your father had a very important part in? Mm. Well, uh, my father first learned about La Cueva de los Tallos here in Ecuador after reading uh, Eric von Daniken's book, Gold of the Gods or Chariots of the Gods, that, that was published in the 70s. Previous to reading Gold of the Gods, my father had been involved in, in his own investigations to do with ancient cultures. So the Taoist story was part of this puzzle he was putting together, um, quite an important piece in his, his mind, and that's what uh, you know, pushed him to start organising the major scientific um, expedition that went into the caves. So, I mean, so he read Eric von Daniken's books in, in the 70s and then he started putting together what is a multidisciplinary team um, which was made up of over a hundred scientists and military um, staff uh, put together with both the Ecuadorian and British governments. So the first visit my father made to Ecuador was in 1975 and that was a reconnaissance trip he made here so he could meet authorities, embassies, um, and in that trip, he, that's when he first met Juan Morris uh, near, near the end of his first stay. Um, they had a long chat, they found they had a lot of uh, theories in common, a lot of views on, on ancient cultures in common, so in that sense they seemed to get on quite well from the start. Um, at that time my father didn't speak any Spanish, so that's where Dr. Peña comes in, he was their translator. Uh, for all these conversations, because I, I, I know Juan Morris spoke a few languages, but one of those was in English for some reason. So Dr. Peña played, played quite a key part in tra translating uh, all, their, all their chat. So my father, after his reconnaissance trip, managed to... I mean, it, it was quite hard to put the expedition together because not everything came to plan or fell under the plan he had, so there was always going back and forth with financing, with the uh, military staff, uh, the government didn't give them permission till very late, so it was quite, it, he, he describes it one of the hardest things he's ever had to do, but somehow, you know, finally all came together and then it was July of 1976, the, the plane with this people from Britain made their way to Ecuador. Uh, so it was about a month that they spent in the area of the Rio Coangos in the Morona Santiago province in southeast Ecuador. Um, the team was made up of biologists, ornithologists, archaeologists, cave experts and military staff. So in that sense it was able to gather a more comprehensive and um, complete information of the area and its geology, its biology and all its surroundings. Um, in that sense the cavers were able to map uh, a large portion of, of the caves um, and, and again the scientists collected enough samples to keep the, the, their labs busy for, for a long time. They, they declared a success afterwards. So the, the scientific expedition was First of all, a scientific expedition, and it was in that sense successful. They managed to stay away from the controversy behind what uh, Eric von Daniken's claims. Uh, at the end of the day, the Ecuadorian government had funded one of Juan Moritz's expeditions into the caves in 1969, 
to see whether this was actually true or not. Um, both in the Juan Moritz and the Stan Hall expeditions, no treasure was found uh, to this day, yeah. What, do you know what your father's number one uh, motive or goal was uh, within the whole story? We're talking about a cave, mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, possible treasures of possibly very ancient civilization. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. what um, Juan Moritz uh, yeah. claimed. Yeah. And there's a, the book of Eric von Däniken. Did your father ever mention what was the first starting point, uh, starting point for his uh, organizing of this expedition? What did he expect to find? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of what Juan Moritz and Eric von Daniken claimed to be in this treasure, before my father had investigated further into the matter, the claims that came from Juan Moritz and Eric von Daniken were quite uh, astounding in the sense that there was this m massive treasure under these, this, this underground system of caves that wasn't even well known at that time and also that it contained a library of metal books and crystal books with writing and no, no such things has ever been found in South America before so uh, my father saw South America as a missing link in history so in that sense um, there was, I suppose there was um, it's very serious claims, it's a very serious subject, so and my father thought, well, if this is true, we need to prove it's true. We need to find out with backup, with proper scientific backup, whether these claims are true, and that was his first reaction to, to hearing about the story. And what did he think? Why did they... Why couldn't they find uh, the things that, for instance, Juan Moritz mentioned? Well, this is where the key person, in, another key person in the story comes in, and that is Petronio Jaramillo, who turns out was the, the person who actually saw or found the treasure, and all the descriptions of treasure and the caves come from Petronio. He was introduced to Juan Moritz in 1964, where they, they, uh, Petronio told Moritz about the, the Taos treasure and again Juan Moritz had been conducting his own studies on ancient cultures in South America previous to that so again he found this to be a key piece in his puzzle. In that sense uh, Petronio had uh, promised not to himself not to reveal the location of this treasure so he never told anyone exactly which caves contain this treasure. Um, in that sense, we're talking about a cave system that goes from Colombia down to Bolivia. So choosing one cave out of all, that's quite tricky. Um, and in, in not having Petronio give you the exact coordinates, Juan Moritz made an estimate for himself and conducted his own smaller expeditions to this area in the Rio Coangos uh, during many years before, um, in 1968, he went in there with the Mormon expedition. There was a Mormon expedition in 68. And then in 69, that's when he managed to get the Ecuadorian government with the backing of the Argentinian government to go into the caves in the area of Juan Moritz specified to look for the treasure. Nothing was found, and my father believes that is because Petronio wasn't involved in, in this expedition and he was the one that actually knew where the treasure was. Uh, Juan Moritz, at the end of the day, was maybe just estimating with his own calculations where this treasure could be. As uh, far as I know, there was a third person who is said to be down in the case with Juan Moritz, and this is the Argentinian uh, Julio Goyan. Mm -hmm. Did your father ever meet this Julio Goyan? My father met Julio Goyan um, in the expedition of 76 because uh, Juan Moritz asked my father if Julio could join the expedition. So uh, Julio came uh, to Ecuador uh, near the end of the expedition and went into the caves with my father and Neil Armstrong um, at the end of July, start of August of 1976, and he spent some time with my father because he stayed in the same hotel. And that's as far as I know his, uh, his kind of relationship went with Julio Goyen. 
And what did your father think of these two gentlemen, Julio Goyen and Juan Moritz? Uh, well, in terms of Julio Goyen, I my father has no opinion as mm -hmm. I know so far. Uh, in terms of Juan Moritz, they knew each other for a few years and my father had a lot of respect for Juan Moritz. Uh, in terms of his dedication to the investigation, to his work, I mean, he, he sacrificed a lot. He wasn't he wasn't really getting rich from this story, so he would he would use his own money, his own resources to keep investigating, and he had done so for many years. And my father admired Juan Moritz, and um, they respected him a lot, but also thought he was a bit of a stubborn man. <laughs> he was, I mean, in that sense, you see when he put his uh, his uh, what's it? When you see the document he presented to the Ecuadorian government with the, his terms on the treasure. He wouldn't budge, he wouldn't, he wouldn't accept the government to change his terms for an expedition to the caves in that sense. Uh, that's when my dad thought he was, you know, very, very stubborn in that sense. So when we're talking about the expedition, it's uh, really strange for so many people that Juan Moritz didn't take part in this uh, 1960, uh, 1976 expedition organized by Stan Hall. Why could it be? Uh, well, um, as I said, Juan Moritz had made a document uh, together with Dr. Peña to present to the government with his terms on the treasure and on any expedition conducted to find this treasure in that area. In that sense, it included he was in charge of everything that happened. He got to choose uh, how things happened. He had to have a helicopter at his disposal equipment at his disposal, people from the government helping and in that sense he wasn't, he didn't want to back down from that so he wanted to be in charge. So when the, my father's expedition ch came he obviously he couldn't be in charge of this British Ecuadorian expedition he could only come as a guest and uh, that's, that's the reason he didn't attend. Okay and um... Mr. Julio Goyen uh, was a member of the expedition. Do we know any follow-ups after the expedition, whether Stan Hall, uh, Julio Goyen, or Juan Morins, or the three together sat down and sorted out uh, the reasons why the expedition couldn't get to this specific uh, or most important part of the Cueva de los Tallos, this metal library, as we call it? Well, my like I said, um, basically uh, Julio Goyen's role in all of this was through Juan Moritz, being a friend of Juan Moritz, but apart from that, uh, I don't think my father had any further relationship with Julio. Um, Juan Moritz was, I suppose, a key person in the story after that. So. I don't believe they met after the expedition to discuss uh, why they did find the treasure, mainly again because the, the expedition was mounted not for finding treasures, but for mapping the area. You know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't going with a motive or, or expecting to find treasure, so in that sense, then my father decided to continue with his investigation as to how a treasure of this type could have ended up in South America. And of course, Juan Moritz continued with his own s studies, and my, my father, um, suppose, respected very much Juan Moritz's um, position. He was uh, closed about something sometimes, and my father wasn't someone to be uh, annoying him about this or asking him too, too much because he, he respected Juan Moritz's position. They, my father, he went back to live in Scotland after the expedition, so he only came back on, on different trips. Uh, they had a couple of, they got involved briefly together in the Nambija um, project, the, the, the mining concessions that Juan Moritz tried to develop for a while, um, and sometimes shared information on their own investigations, but apart from that, they were very much individual people who coming from their own different backgrounds went in their own directions. Um, they lost touch in 1982 for a while and they met only once before Juan Moritz's death in 91. 
So it's only in 91, after Juan Moritz dies, that my father decides to contract, top, sorry, contact Petronio Jaramillo uh, to form a six, then what became a six, seven year collaboration with Petronio to do with the Italian's treasure. And that's when he finds out that Juan Moritz um, had obtained his information about the caves from Petronio. Uh, what was the purpose of this uh, uh, few years cooperation between uh, Stan Hall and Petronio Jaramillo? Well, uh, their collaboration started in 91 when my father uh, visited uh, Petronio in his home in Esmeraldas. And Petronio had heard about my father through the media and through what he had been involved in um, and had been waiting for my father to contact him for a long time. So they, 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 they again, Petronio had a lot of things to say to my father, vice versa, my father, since he found out that the story originally came from Petronio, had to make sure that he asked all the right questions, he asked all the questions and he made sure that Petronio was able to give him as much as information about this treasure as possible. And of course they both decided it would be best for Petronio not to disclose the, the location to, to, uh, to keep them safe and their families, you know. Um, yeah. So Petronio stayed with the location and uh, my father also needed enough time to assess whether Petronio was lying. So this is why it was so many years uh, of them. My father asked Petronio the same questions over and over again and to make sure he was given the same answers or similar answers and he wasn't lying. So it was only after this long period of time that my father was able to say, I believe Petronio and I believe uh, the treasure exists. But in that sense, Petronio also said that the treasure is not located um, in the area of Morona Santiago, where, where the previous expeditions had gone, but he said it was further, further north. Um, and unfortunately, well, um, then, then came a plan to organize a second major expedition into the caves, this time with Petronio disclosing the right location. And again, the, both the British and Ecuadorian governments were going to be involved, uh, possibly Neil Armstrong again as a president. So this was all rolling and while my father uh, went back to Scotland and was trying to find uh, funding for this expedition, uh, unfortunately Petronio was killed um, just outside his home in Esmeraldas and that's where that, that kind of faltered. So then my father had to find a way of um, he managed to get some funding to uh, go on smaller reconnaissance trips into areas where he estimated, according to Petronius' clues and Petronius' descriptions, uh, the, the closest, uh, I mean, the most similar features geologically to Petronius' description. So in that sense, my father was able to kind of knock away the useless pieces and, and be able to kind of uh, sift through the information to come to um, a, 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 some sort of a location that he, he estimated the, the treasure was to be found. And according to this version, the version of uh, uh, Petronio Jaramillo, um, what's, there? what's down there? Well, basically uh, what's in the treasure caves is uh, different different chambers filled with golden statues um, and then there's also a chamber filled with many metal books uh, possibly made of copper, uh, sorry, a gold or, or a gold copper uh, mixture. There's also what he described as a metal library of um, little plaques of crystal, very clear crystal and um, the, the metal library has inscriptions and um, what he could only describe could be similar to Sanskrit or Eastern uh, language or, or, or um, sorry, symbols, um, and the the crystal library contained uh, each plate contained engraved channels with diamond encrustations. So one was would, one I suppose was more um, the mental library was something more similar to uh, to to writings here and then the crystal plates were something he had not ever seen before. He tried to scratch the plates and he couldn't. He wrote his initials on seven of the books that he took down and also on the walls, but he describes the crystal as being too hard uh, to scratch. Um, and uh, there was, 
uh, like I said, there was uh, many chambers. Um, some of them filled with toys, with marbles, with workshop, what looked like machines for making jewellery, um, animals on pedestals. Um, not a fly or, a, or an elephant was missing from these. Uh, there's also a mixture between human and animal features. There was another chamber filled with a uh, kind of maternally uh, with maternally themed uh, sculptures, mothers holding child and um, and things like that. Um, possibly he's, he described some doors covered in rubies and precious stones, possibly tombs, possibly other doorways. There was a skeleton whose bones had been covered in gold that was lying in a crystal coffin. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's quite a description and my father said, do you understand what you're describing? This sounds impossible. And, and Petronio said, yes, but it's what I saw. Uh, are there any pictures or is there any person who has ever seen a picture, a photo or a sketch of these uh, objects, artifacts? As far as I know, no, there isn't. Um, Petronio's reason for not being able to take photos is one, he thought people would think they were fake and second, uh, you, would, you need to go underwater to enter this, these chambers. He went to visit the treasure in uh, 1946. In that time, it would have been very hard for him to take camera equipment underwater and, and such and he was only 17 years old at the time. So in that sense, he and he didn't feel right taken away something that belonged to this uh, advanced culture. He, he had a high respect for the treasure and that's also the reason why he didn't just tell anyone about, about it or, or its location. So uh, Petronio Jaramillo went down to the caves only once in his lifetime. Yes. And why is it that? Do we know? Well, um, I, well my father um, believes that it was his uncle uh, called uh, Gerardo, uh, sorry, Gilberto, Gilberto Jaramillo, who was also in the army, like Petronio was, um, who had told Petronio about this treasure and had given him instructions on his deathbed on how to get to the treasure. So after his uncle died, Petronio took his uncle's instructions and went to visit the treasure. Um, and that's how we know he found out where it was. And, and so the story continues. I still don't understand why this Petronio Jaramillo never thought of going back again to the caves. He Especially when this whole story was blown up yeah. by Eric von Deniken, then Juan Moritz also had a part in uh, talking about it uh, um, uh, in front of the media. Why could he just rest and not uh, taking his point of view more clearly or not uh, going back? for so many years, uh, until 1991, when yeah. they were uh, trying to organize it for the second time with Stan Hall? Well, I mean, that's a good question, yeah. Um, Petronio, after he went in, he said he would have to go back no matter what. I suppose time went by and life took over and he just he just didn't find how or, or maybe when you're young, I don't know. I think I'm getting a bit, I don't know, I can't say I know the answer to this question, but I know that he contacted Andres Fernandez Salvador, who is, um, he is, he's kind of, he's an explorer that looks for Atahualpa's treasure in the Yanganates region. So because he was known to do this, Petronio was introduced to Andres to see if Andres could help him organize an expedition to find the treasure. Andres, uh, Andres uh, refused because he was too busy with his uh, expeditions into the Yanganates region and he had just come from uh, one where he had uh, crashed in a helicopter, sorry, helicopter and uh, broke, damaged his leg so he wasn't in any position to help him out. So that's when uh, he was introduced, Andres introduced Petronio to Juan Moritz and Juan Moritz was then the one who went on to explore the subject further. Um, the only thing Petronio found was um, a lot of people, um, um, there was 
there was a few people that contacted him asking for information and I think through all the he mentioned some of these people getting quite angry with him about not revealing more information or the location so I think in that sense maybe Petronio closed himself a wee bit from, from people trying to force information out of, out of him um, and he, like he said, I said he wouldn't, he wouldn't disclose the, the, the location. I think Juan Morris asked him a few times to tell him where it is, and, and Petronio, he had made a promise to himself he wouldn't. So in that sense, all these people, there was Pino Tirola, and there was Juan Morris, and there was also you know Julio Goyen with Juan Morris. They all went off to find the treasure, but without Petronio telling them exactly where it was, no one could pinpoint the right location? I, um, I have a version in which uh, we know that Juan Moritz claimed to be the, the finder and proprietor of these treasures. Did Stan Holt uh, question him about this claim, which was laid, uh, as far as I know, in front of the uh, president mm -hmm. of Ecuador of, the, of those days? Did they ever talk about this claim? Is it was it an official claim? It um, was an official claim. Yeah. Has anybody seen a copy of this document uh, that, uh, according to my knowledge, was also signed uh, um, on behalf of the president or the Ecuadorian government? Well, the the, the official uh, document was put together with one more. Uh, with Juan Moritz and Dr. Peña's help, and they presented this to the government. And the government here in such, I suppose, such um, serious outstanding claims wanted to, to go and prove that that was the case. That's when they organized the first expedition, which didn't find anything. So after that, the, the government decided they wouldn't, they wouldn't help anymore. And uh, in that sense, Juan Moritz always, always said, yes, he had found the treasure, and it was in those caves, and my father had talked with him also before coming with his expedition and Juan Moritz again claimed that the treasure was there. But he never explained the reasons that this expedition, these expeditions never found the treasures? It, as far as I know from my father, I don't, 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 I actually don't have that information, I don't know, I don't know. And why was it so important only mapping the exact lo location of this possible treasure. What, what do you mean, sorry? <laughs> uh, nobody has seen the treasure. Yeah. It's uh, still a legend, yeah. maybe. Okay. But it seems to be important for two governments, the government of uh, United Kingdom and the Equatorian government, to put up an expedition of more than 100 people, scientists and soldiers, mm -hmm. uh, to map a territory of what? Why, in, in this sense, we don't have the treasure, uh, why was it so important to map the territory? Well, obviously to have, because these caves hadn't been thoroughly explored before, it was important just to have a map of the caves in the first place. and because the expedition in 76 came with the, you know, with uh, the motive to explore the area and map the area. Again, it was important not to rely on having find a treasure or tagging along to some the controversy caused by Eric von Daniken's book. So in that sense, my father, being a civil engineer, he wanted to be strictly scientific. We're going to map this underworld which Juan Moritz talks about and the area surrounding it but we're not going to talk about treasure because as soon as you talk about treasure people get uh, you know they, they think they just think about gold and about money instead of focusing on on the story behind the the treasure and again because Juan Moritz was so certain as the location his location which he believed where treasure was at he was very certain about you know, they thought, okay, let's go and explore this since there's, these claims are very serious, let's, let's see if they're true. And what is the story according to your father, Stan Hall, behind the treasures? Oh, where he believes it comes from, or 
What is the story we are talking about behind the treasure? If we don't want to talk about the physical value of the treasures, okay. what other values can we talk about? If we're talking about a library that has, you know, maybe thousands of books, uh, we're talking about the, the missing history of this country uh, and this continent, possibly, is what my father believed. Um, he believed that the treasure came from an advanced ancient civilization, um, maybe, maybe linked to Atlantis and linked also to the formative cultures of this continent. But the thing is, we, he saw this as a piece of evidence. The treasure was the evidence to back up the theories. So unless, until this treasure was found, we wouldn't know for certain, we can't know for sure where it comes from or who it belongs to and, or what history it might contain because there's many different theories as to what could be, could be in there. But in that sense, because my father believed South America is a missing piece in world history and, and prehistory and Ecuador also a key in this, then that's why he put so much attention and uh, time into finding out about the, the history of the Tayo's treasure. So, uh, whether there, your father contacted any shore leader or somebody from the shore community that knew Moritz, uh, because Moritz claimed that he was introduced to the cave system by shores. Okay. So, is there a shore person who ever? Uh, supported more its um, version? As far as I know, I don't know of any Schwarz no, that supported Juan Moritz's uh, uh, claims. I know that he did get help from the communities to go into the caves. I mean, he had guides from the area and things like that, because uh, he not only went in around the Rio Coangos area, but into the Nangaritsa region, which is just a f bit farther in. So for that, he, he used help from the Schwar. Uh, my father had to get permission, of course, from the Shuar to f for his expedition. Um, I, I think, oh, um, I don't know of any particular community, particular leader that he was in touch with. I know he was in touch with the leaders for forming the park, the national park, mm -hmm. and he was made a blood brother of the Shuar. Uh, just for his efforts in conserving, conserving the area and, and, and his, his work. So he, my father didn't, no, he didn't mention, not that I can remember any particular person. There lived an Italian priest called Father Crespi in Cuenca, who is said to collect artifacts uh, taken from the Taos cave system from the local uh, community people to him as uh, um, presents. Mm -hmm. And I know that your father, Stan Hawkon, visited him in 1975. We even have a video, a short video, on their meetings. Uh, what was uh, Stan Hall's impression on Father Crespi and the artifacts that he saw in his uh, place in Cuenca. Okay, uh, well my father ended up visiting Father Crespi because he was on a reconnaissance trip to the to the Morona Santiago area through he went through Cuenca and they had to get transport in Cuenca and couldn't find anyone to speak English and he had heard you know Padre Crespi speaks English so in that sense he thought well we'll visit Padre Crespi it wasn't planned it was just a kind of, they had some time they went to see him and uh, Padre Crespi had a vast collection of artifacts uh, and he showed my father the, the ones you see in Eric von Daniken's book. My father didn't speak English, uh, I mean Spanish and Father Crespi uh, was just, you know, in the video you see was trying to talk about his artifacts so in that sense they didn't get a lot of communication or uh, my father didn't get a lot of information from him. Uh, and that was, I think, the last he saw of Padre Crespi. He was impressed because, I mean, he is a well-known figure. He was well-known by the, by the city, by the surrounding communities for his work um, in, the, in the church. And, uh, I mean, he helped, he helped people and there's a statue to commemorate um, Padre Crespi in Cuenca in the square. 
As far as artefacts go, no one has been able to date them or find out whether they are original or not because some people even say they were... He used to buy a lot of things from from the communities, you know. Um, so, who knows? Some people suggest it was made quite recently, they were made quite recently to give to him, others don't, and unfortunately no one took the time or the, you know, uh, made a further investigation into the origin or the the, the age. Uh, we, we went to Cuenca last year to find out what was happening or what happened to the collection and uh, we met with uh, some of the fathers at the, at the church that um, Padre Crespi used to reside in. Um, they kept some of the pieces, um, all the originals went to the central bank in Cuenca and they also talked about an Austrian guy who had taken the collection to Europe, some of the pieces to Europe to showcase, but that was the last they heard of that. Um, and we couldn't, that, that's as far as we got, we couldn't get, we didn't get to see any artifacts and they couldn't give us any more information. So in that sense, the Padre Crespi story is still uh, open and unfinished because we, we none of us know uh, whether the pieces were original or not. And how could this Austrian guy take any artifacts with him? Did he buy? Did he? No, he, he just said he wanted to take them to showcase in Europe to show show the pieces in Europe. And, and who gave it to him? The, the the fathers, the the padres in in the in the church there. Just. It seems like it. And you don't know the name? We don't. Well, I mean, I suppose if you went to ask them, invest, we didn't stay for too long, so if you go maybe with more time and more questions. I didn't know much, so I just went to see if I could see the artifacts, and then we got talking to these uh, fathers, uh, these priests, mm -hmm. and uh, that's as far as, as we got uh, with that investigation. Did your father ever go back to contact on Father Crespi after no. this meeting? No. Uh -huh. Some people say, or this is what I heard, that some of the artifacts were even taken to the Vatican. Yeah, we've heard that as well. Who was it that told you? Yeah, we've heard that story well, as we well. Don't have no confirmation against. Try and get permission from the Vatican to get in is another <laughs> thing, isn't it? Yeah. If they're in the Vatican, who knows? They're very close to their collection. Um, do you have maybe information, did your father ever mention that Juan Moritz uh, contacted Father Crespi? No. They no. had no contact? I, they probably did oh. have contact, but, but my father didn't mention uh, what kind of contact they had, no. I think, I think Juan Moritz took Eric von Daniken to Padre Crespi, so, so he obviously knew, they knew each other, but did your father meet Eric von Daniken personally? Uh, uh, yes, they did in 2007. My father was invited by Eric von Daniken to Switzerland. So my father spent a week there with Eric. And those time when uh, Juan Moritz and uh, Eric von Daniken had the conflict mm -hmm. over Eric von Daniken's statements in mm -hmm. his book, mm -hmm. Uh, he, Eric von der Nicken, uh, declared in his book that he was taken to the Taios cave, to the library, by Juan Moritz, mm -hmm. and uh, which Juan Moritz uh, denied. What was your father's point of view on this conflict, on this issue? Well, my father got the story, I suppose, afterwards from Juan Moritz, and Juan Moritz told my father that the trip with Eric Van Daniken involved, uh, he took Eric to Cuenca, and then they went to a cave nearby and just kind of saw the entrance, but in terms of treasure, Juan Moritz did not take Eric Van Daniken to see any treasure. Uh, for, further along, we find out that Eric Van Daniken was using an artist license, you know, a writer's license to, to dramatize the whole thing a bit more, which he, I think, later on uh, corrected in, in some of his work. But those days, uh, Stan Hall didn't meet personally Eric van der Nicken. No. no. The only time they met was in 2007, or as far yeah. as you know. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I think they, I mean, they were in touch uh, on and off. I suppose through emails or mails, but nothing. And, and Sam Hall had a point, uh, a definite point of view, uh, a, as a personal uh, opinion. 
personal opinion on Eric Van Daniken, I mean, they got on very well. Uh, he didn't have criticism as his, you know, as a person, Eric Van Daniken. Now, when uh, when we refer to Eric's work uh, with the ancient astronaut theories, uh, my father um, agrees with um, with the book being published because the book set out very important questions about the history of of civilizations, of the world, of you know all these missing pieces in, in, in the current histor historical model we're given. So in that sense my father said yes, Eric von Daniken was right in publishing Gold of the Gods. And the way he did it, maybe not so much, you know, because he over uh, fantasized a lot of things. So um, again my again important questions asked by Eric von Daniken, but also my father uh, believed it was important to separate aliens from gods and from priests. Uh, the ancient astronaut theorist uh, believed that uh, all the gods in the sky were aliens or extraterrestrial beings and of course Juan Moritz and my father have a different version, different theory of that, so in that case um, that's, that's where the, the, you know, they didn't, their work didn't match. So. Uh, well, okay, uh, I can tell you that the earliest memories I have of my father are him reading books, him typing books, uh, him being out doing stuff. We were never sure what he was doing. We could never tell you what my father's job was. Well, I thought he was an engineer, but he was up to all sorts, you know, meeting with Petronio. I do, I mean, my father, again, my our family, Petronio's family, used to, you know, meet. Uh, take holidays together sometimes. We used to play with Petronio's son and daughter uh, while my father and him discussed whatever, you know, whatever they needed to discuss about the Tanya's story. Um, so in that sense, we were kind of, you know, part of it, but at the same time we had no idea what was going on. Uh, our, my father, to me, again, I think was a bit mysterious as well because I could never pinpoint exactly what he was doing or what he was. and. Uh, I was again too young, I mean, to, to, to understand, I suppose, all, all that. Um, so we never asked, we just got on with it and our father doing his things, going off, coming back. Then when we moved to Scotland, uh, we started noticing his expeditions to the jungle. He would come back covered in mosquito bites, you know, going, oh, the jungle's horrible, it's, you know, <laughs> it rains, you get bitten and all of that. So it, I just remember him looking very tired every time he came back from the jungle because it's, I mean, by that point he was 60, 70 years old when he was going into these smaller expeditions and uh, I've been to the jungle, it's not, not an easy place to trek in, so uh, yeah, I remember that. Um, I was there when my father uh, was writing his books again, just always saw my father writing, reading, um, investigating, questioning a lot. He used to question TV all the time. Oh, look at that, look at that, that's not right. Or, you know, question this, always question that, never believe what anyone tells you, and you know. So, um, again, my father was like no one else I've met before. Um, to me, he, he just had a great heart. You know, he was just so honest and very open to the point that, you know, I. I didn't have to question him, you know, question him too much. I mean, I questioned him a lot, but it was when he died that I realized he hadn't been lying to me, you know, that I thought, okay, I can believe what you've been telling me now, and I can, I can hold you true to what, what you've been trying to teach or what you've been looking at, research, and, and uh, um, it was only when he started, when he got cancer in 2008, that I started taking a real interest in his work. I had read his books, I had helped him design some of his covers, but because I was busy in university, I, again, I didn't have the time to get uh, deep, more deeply involved. So, like I said, it was when he was told um, he had two years to live. I decided not to, uh, well, to leave my studies for a bit and kind of, I offered to be his secretary for a while or until he passed away so that I could help move along his work. Uh, my father was not one to, um, to be able to handle technology too well, so he struggled with computers. I mean, most of his manuscripts were hand typed, you know, on older kind of typewriters, so uh, for him a computer was uh, too too scary, and uh, he couldn't 
he moved slower because he couldn't work with technology. So in that sense, I thought, okay, I can help because I, I'm a designer, I can do this, I can do that. So I offered my services, he accepted. And unfortunately, the doctors got the diagnosis wrong, so my father died three months after he was diagnosed with cancer instead of two years. Um, and um, when I started, like I said, getting more involved in his work, reading all his books, I realized it's only then that it hit me just how important his work is or his investigations had been to do with our history, humankind's history. I mean, I didn't, I thought it was just Ecuador or the Tayos caves. And then I realized his, what was important wasn't the treasures but the story behind the treasure and how it came to be and how it connected um, the history of South America, the history of Europe, of, of the world in the end. I mean, the, his work I still find very hard to understand sometimes because it's quite comprehensive. So I uh, decided that it, uh, he had spent a lifetime doing this. I thought it can't just sit there. You can't just leave work sitting there. Who's going to do something? So I decided to just however I could, carry on. Um, in that sense, I managed to get f uh, some funding to come to Ecuador for a year and um, photograph the pieces of a collection my father had rescued from uh, a Dr. Carrillo, who lived in the center, historic center here in Quito, which were on loan to the uh, um, uh, San Francisco University here in Quito, and they were being stored there. So my father always wanted to create an online museum for the pre-Columbian cultures of Ecuador. And that was the whole point of uh, having this collection as well, to be able to make this information more widely available and also to see if people can take interest in the, in the prehistory of Ecuador and the continent. So I came and uh, with the help of Manuel we took the photographs and I'm still trying to put together this online museum. Again, it's only when I came to Ecuador I realized that things are not as straightforward as you think they're going to be. I had all these plans, I'm going to do this, do that, and things here just work in a different way. So that got delayed a bit. And then I had to, I'd always promised my dad I would finish my university course. So I went back for a year to Scotland to graduate. So I graduated in architecture. And then after that, it's hard to um, try and do normal stuff normal studying when you've got all these fantastic stories in your head. I mean, my dad's work just goes round and round in my head and sometimes you can't, I can concentrate sometimes. I think, I'm always, this is too important, we have to get this done, I have to get this done. And I think I, I also put a lot of pressure on myself to try and do things, but slowly it's been, it's been, it's been going okay. I uh, redesigned the website, added a few more pieces, I translated the website into Spanish and so we released that last year and at the moment I'm trying to publish his last book, Savage Genesis. This is the book he tried to publish as he was passing away. Uh, but because, uh, again, of restrictions, time, we didn't get that done. So at the moment I'm working to have this book published. It's pretty important because that's the one where he lays out all his theories, all his connections between ancient peoples and uh, many other subjects. Um, so. That's what we're doing, and um, the online museum I'm still carrying on with. I'm hoping to get time to finish that, and uh, we'll see how, how things go from there. So just to finish our uh, interview on the Tayos and Stanley Ho, your father, I would like if you could uh, tell us some personal um, memories you have, maybe, or something that uh, your father taught to you, or something that you could read out from your father's documents or books. Um, I mean, how he related to Juan Moritz, what he thought of him, whether he appreciated him, what was the relation they had. Um, Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, right, well, I could read something and I could also uh, comment on my father's personal relationship. Uh, my father respected Moritz very much and he was an admirer of Moritz because he was uh, a true explorer. My, my father said that a lot of people would kill to 
to do half of the stuff he managed to do here in Ecuador. Um, and my, f I mean, they, they shared a lot of knowledge in, in ancient history and, and cultures and mythology, you know, philosophy, all sorts. They, they shared a lot, a lot of common ground on their views, you know, both, both being uh, believers in catastrophism and, and such. So, um, in that sense, my father found someone who he could uh, relate to and also learn from. Uh, while he was here in Ecuador. Uh, my father also believed that uh, Juan Moritz's work is, is, is very, um, it's not well known, but it's a serious subject that someone should really investigate further. So in that sense, my father was quite keen on, on making uh, Hungarian connections and, and kind of following up some of Moritz's work so that uh, someone could maybe pick up this work and, and see whether any of it was, was correct. Uh, if any of his theories are actually are actually true, to do with the the Hungarian Magyar South American connection, as well as I suppose Hungarian Celtic, Hungarian Sumerian, and Egyptian connection. So, we we have a lot of of you know work to do, and uh, my father believed that Magyar was the key to solving a lot of the you know Sumerian Egyptian texts. Uh, which are usually translated into English or with German or, or Jewish, I believe, but uh, the sounds, the, the letter sounds, the alphabets are not really suitable for translating um, Sumerian text and, and such. So in that sense, this is quite a young, a young piece of work trying to, I suppose, decipher um, these Middle Eastern texts with Magyar, and that's something my father was uh, going to talk about in his uh, Histories and Mysteries conference before he passed away, so he didn't get a chance to do that. I think one of the next steps was for my father to take even some of Moritz's work, take it further and investigate a bit more. Uh, he has documents, he's got uh, some sorry, some articles on the Hungarian Celtic connection on his website and also the uh, Magyar key to the Egyptian and Sumerian texts if anyone's interested. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, my father took, you know, he knew Moritz for a long time and my father, again, wasn't one to just believe everyone or anyone just for the sake of, of believing. So he, I'm sure he tested Moritz on many times just as he tested Petronio. And in that sense, I, my father uh, truly believed in some of Moritz's work. So in that sense, it's quite a serious subject that uh, should be paid more attention to and uh, definitely investigated further. Um, in terms of their personal relationship, um, again, both individuals, they both shared a lot of views on life, philosophy, history. They got on very well and uh, I think it was Gaston Fernandez that said that uh, if Moritz was ever to tell someone the location of the treasure, it would be my father, Stan Hall. So um, I, that, that again shows that, that kind of uh, strong connection they had, the, the two of them. Um, so I'm just going to read a little extract from my father's book on Moritz so you can get a better idea of the kind of man Moritz was. Um, so apparently, a word I came to use a lot. Those who knew Morris admired his high level of culture, knowledge, and field ability. At our marathon meeting, I had introduced everything I could think of dealing with comparative religion, philosophy, theosophy, prehistory, catastrophism, evolution, intercontinental migrations, folk folklore, world wars, here and there laying little traps, as I am sure he did with me. Apart from Hungarian, he was fluent in Spanish, Italian, German, French, and to a lesser extent, Russian, though curiously not English. His knowledge of ancient history and languages was impressive. In short, a brilliant man, calm in his arguments and convictions. Yet the same question kept coming back. Was he perhaps some kind of Rasputin or Alistair Crowley? able to mesmerize listeners into believing him through sheer force or personality. After all, I was using words like brilliance just to get some perspective on his capacities and achievements. So, I, 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 you know, that's quite a good paragraph for describing Dad's, um, Dad's thoughts on Moritz.
and I know he was he was very impressed by their uh, smaller expeditions and trips to Mendes just before the expedition in seventy five, where Moritz showed my dad some uh, inscriptions on some stones uh, near Mendes. So it was it was during that that time that my father, I suppose, kind of opened his eyes to to the world of Moritz and 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 the work he was involved in. Um, so that kept my father actually coming back. I think I think. Moritz's work was some of the reasons, you know, my father kept coming back to Ecuador because it wasn't just him with these theories. Juan Moritz's kind of backed up a lot of my father's theories also. So that meant my father kept coming back for more and more and more. Um, and again, he always mentioned it was a shame that Juan Moritz didn't publish anything, you know, further than, than his articles. So in that sense, anyone who has his library, maybe in Argentina, um, could, could bring some, some more stuff to light.